Hi there, I'm Ko Im, the community editor and podcast co-host here at Adweek. You're tuned in to another edition of Adweek Together, our forward-looking series. And before we get started, we want to give you a gentle reminder about our Adweek subscription. You can go to adweek.com slash offer to unlock unlimited access to essential content and resources. Today, we are going to talk about the future of social with one of our creative 100 nominees. We have Matt Kobach joining us from Atlanta, Georgia. Good morning. How are you? Or good afternoon. Yeah, as I say, it's morning for you. It's <laughs> afternoon for me. So good morning to you. Good afternoon to me. I'm doing great. <laughs> and you have just started a, a new job, but I want to give folks a little bit of background. Um, you know, I know that you studied social media while you're pursuing your PhD. What else do you want to kind of tell our audience about um, your background and your interest and your expertise in social media. Yeah, let's see if I can do it in 60 seconds. I'll tell I'll tell <laughs> kind of how I ended up right here as succinctly as possible. So when I graduated, I wanted, I was interested in marketing and was interested in psychology. I literally Googled those two things and what came up was a master's program that combined the two. It looked at how marketing, how media affects people. And so I pursued a master's in that really liked it wanted and I got it and wanted to then further do that and get a PhD. PhD moved kind of slowly. I was focusing on social media. Social media was changing. This is like 2007, eight, nine, 10. Uh, social media was changing so fast that it was tough to keep up academically. You know, like uh, Facebook would launch a, a new thing for their newsfeed or advertising became a thing or Twitter or Instagram. Uh, so I paused that and I started with a social media analytics firm where they grabbed content from different platforms, so Facebook, Twitter, and blogs, and then we analyzed it, sold that information to brands, let them make better decisions based on what people were telling them about their movies, products, whatever it might be. Uh, during that time, I saw a lot of really bad social media, so I decided to open my own social media marketing firm. We did uh, Facebook advertising buying and created the content. And that's when I learned that the part of it that I really loved was creating the content. So that's when I looked for a, a job that, you know, a more steady job, which ended up being with Intercontinental Exchange, which is the parent company of the New York Stock Exchange. They're based in Atlanta, which is why I'm in Atlanta now. So I lived here for two years, did social media for all their businesses. Um, I don't have the number, but it's something like 40. And I uh, did that for two years in Atlanta. They said, hey, New York Stock Exchange is probably where your social media efforts can make the biggest difference in our business. Do you want to move to New York? Do that. Did that. Uh, so that was three, four years ago. And then got the opportunity to join a new tech startup called Fast, which is hoping to change the way that we log in on the internet and buy stuff on the internet. And it was a super exciting company that I was passionate about that I think solved a legitimate problem that I think a lot of people have. So I joined and it's still early there and still figuring it out. Yeah. And I think that you still have that kind of analytical process um, in terms of thinking about social media strategy, right? Let's talk about um, your time at the New York Stock Exchange. Um, mm -hmm. You were on Snapchat a lot, kind of taking people behind the scenes. Um, it was something that you realized that people um, would enjoy access to while giving them information about certain stocks. What was kind of the, the thinking there about, you know, doing what you can with what you have in terms of platforms? Yeah, so the Snapchat started, um, we got active on Snapchat before they were a public company. So we wanted to show them that we uh, use their platform and that if they made a decision to list, they would know that we're already a client. So we wanted to like kind of uh, strengthen the relationship that way. Oh, that's me. Oh, that's so many. Oh, wow, that brings me back. <laughs> I've got I've got more hair both on the top of my head and on my face now. It's a little more clean shaven then. Uh, but so what we decided is, so we wanted to be active on Snapchat, but we had to figure out what we were going to do. So we decided to use our Snapchat to pull back the curtain because uh, it's it's closed to the public, but there's all these cool things going on there. So we wanted to kind of have this fly in the wall aspect of it, where we could have, uh, you know, it, it's really, I've got a cell phone right here. You know, it was just me and a cell phone talking to, you know, celebrities or CEOs or athletes, whoever it might be, and showing them all the cool things that go on here because people want to come in all the time, but they can't. And then layering that with like, what does financial literacy mean? What does it mean to trade stocks? What does it mean to be a public company? And so it was really kind of the uh, sugar with the medicine, you know, show someone really cool that they might recognize and then slip in 
here's what it means to have a diversified portfolio or what it means to invest in an ETF. So we just really wanted to make it accessible. You know, we wanted a really large engaged audience and to do that, we had to talk in simple terms and we had to show people the interesting things that were going on on the floor every day. Yeah, and let's talk about engagement, right? Because that is part of building the community and your brand. Um, I know you have tens of thousands of followers on your account. Um, you come up with these lines, you have like 60 plus, <laughs> um, and you talk everything about you know marketing, content, creativity. I wanna bring up an example um, if our live producer, Nick. Can, yeah, so here, right, yes. long-term marketing. Brand building that endures over time, short-term marketing, sales focus activations that increase revenue. Um, mm -hmm. And this one I think got, you know, uh, over 1200 likes, something like that. Um, what is your thinking when you put out a tweet like this? Is it something that like you're at dinner and you write something on a napkin because you thought about it or, <laughs> or yeah. it's like just, you know, how, how does that work for Matt Kobach? No, no, you're, you're right. It's, it's kind of the napkin. It's just, it's not a napkin. It's the notes thing in my phone. Let me, let me see if I can pull this up. I'll show you. Cause people ask me this, like, how do you, you know, like you post a lot. So how do you do it so often? Um, I have, let's see. So it, it looks like this and I don't know if the camera can even pick up on it. I guess because it's a little white, well, whatever. These are, these are just hundreds and hundreds of thoughts I've had, uh, that relate to that. And so whenever I'm, you know, something hits me, like it might be at dinner and I've got a very uh, forgiving fiance who I'll sometimes <laughs> say, hey, wait, I had an idea. Just give me like 30 seconds. Let me type this out and then we can go back to what we're doing. And uh, I used to not preface it. You know, I would all of a sudden just kind of have an idea get on my phone and I realized how rude that was to her. So now we're in a good spot where I go, hey, let me just finish this thought. I'll get right back to what we're doing. But it's, it's stuff like that. And then so it gives me a chance to then fine tune. So it's like a half baked idea. And then if I'm looking, I try to stay like my personal goal is to tweet at least once a day, often many more, but I just go to these notes thing, you know, I go to the notes app in, in my phone and I've got hundreds of them to choose from. And a lot of them are bad. Like, uh, the, the, like I said, they're <laughs> half baked and they're, they're not going to be anything, but some of them, it gives me a chance to like, I've got it half baked. And now that I've kind of let it sit there for a little bit, I can think about how to better word it or to make sure that I'm being clear or to just make sure that it has the, you know, it resonates like I want it to. The one thing I, I'm so careful of and I still fail at it is I don't want to put something out that people might misconstrue. And I don't, I don't want that. I don't want to put out something and have them not understand what I'm saying because then that falls on me. I, I you know, I'm the one putting stuff out and I want to make sure I'm as clear as possible. So that one, and I, I, I think I, I think it did well. Uh, the reason I did that one too is I was having a conversation with a friend and we were talking about how a lot of social media marketing is this kind of short term sales. You know, it's swipe up here, it's click this, it's here's the link, it's that last click attribution stuff where they don't do as much as the uh, of the brand building on social media. And brand building is kind of like that lifestyle stuff. It's not asking you to necessarily do an action. It's trying to associate certain uh, pillars or certain attributes to a brand. And on social media, they end up, you know, I think our advertising kind of lacks that long-term vision and instead focuses on the short term. Uh, conversely, then you're going to have people that say, well, great, what's the point of ads if you're never going to sell anything? And so that's why I wanted to make this point that we need both. Like, I'm not trying to say one's better than the other, but on social media, we've over-indexed on the short-term stuff. So let's try to uh, do some stuff that builds equity in this brand so that when we say, hey, we've got something that we want you to buy or sign up for, we've done the work with that audience already that they're willing to listen to what we have to say. And if you look at what we're doing at Fast right now, again, it's still very early, but like that's our plan right now. We're not necessarily asking for anything. We're just trying to build a little momentum, get people familiar with us, get people excited about us so that when we do want to cash in on that and ask for something, they're already rooting for us. We've already got enough credits in the bank that we can make a, a withdrawal and ask them for something. Yeah, I, I want to note that um, also for anyone who is in a relationship, friendship, romantic, whatever, <laughs> with a writer, right? You come up with the same issue of like, mm -hmm. oh, hold on, I have a thought. Let me just write it down. Um, but going back to to what social media is good for, so brand building. So who are the the examples that are doing 
good with social media, doing it well. Um, mm -hmm. And what is social media not good for? So one of my favorite brands, and if you follow me on Twitter, I preach about this company all the time. I love them. But is Chipotle. They're, they do a really good job of uh, staying true to their voice, uh, putting out stuff that's interesting to watch and pay attention to. And they did a really good job of like when the pandemic happened and then when we had, uh, you know, Black Lives Matter and social unrest and all that stuff. They didn't, they, they didn't, uh, uh, like they balanced who they are with what was going on in the world. And that's really difficult to do. And so I was really impressed with how they did that. Uh, another company that does it really well who, and by the way, I steal from all these companies. Anyone doing anything I love, I'm going to steal it and apply it to what I do. And if you're watching this and not doing the same thing, I, you know, like there's no new ideas under the sun. Like if something's working that you see a company doing, do it. And, uh, it's the one company that I'm going to probably, you know, I, I don't even know if steal is from the right word, but I love how cash app does their social media. They have uh, Cash App Fridays. They add money to your account every Friday, and they do it in very fun, very visual ways, and do it in ways that are optimized for each platform they're posting on. So you can see something where we would do something similar, uh, and it's really just a great way to get people interested, invested, and familiar with who you are. Because like I said, my goal right now is just to get people to understand who this new brand is that doesn't have a product yet. And so giving stuff away, building trust is all great ways to do that. So is that kind of how you would advise, you know, a lot of people who might ask you, you know, how do I build my my personal brand or my company's mm -hmm. brand? It's like get, allow people to get to know you and understand you with explainers, with interaction. How kind of do you think about that? Um, you know, as you are one of our creative 100 uh, yeah. thinkers. The, the biggest thing you've got to do is you're going to have to do something that's different than everyone else. So you have to give someone a reason to follow you. And what I was able to do, so let's use, we'll use myself and we'll use the New York Stock Exchange as an example. The biggest asset we had at the New York Stock Exchange is that no one else was the New York Stock Exchange. You could not go to anyone else's profile and see the floor, see the opening bell, see the facade, all that stuff. So you have to lean into what makes you different. And that's your superpower. That's what's going to separate you. And if someone doesn't care that you're the New York Stock Exchange, they're never going to follow you anyways. So it doesn't really matter. You're not alienating anyone by being more of who you are as a brand. So whatever it is that you're good at, whatever it is that separates you, that's what you have to lean into. And when you're talking about brands, you know, the New York Stock Exchange is probably the best example because there's only one. But also, that's kind of how every brand is. If you make a product and anyone else can make that product, the only thing that differentiates you is your brand. You know, if I make a, a, you know, cashew milk, anyone else can make cashew milk. The difference is what brand do I attach to that product? And then how do I make that brand resonate with the audience? And so that's why you have to clearly define who your brand is or what your brand is, what you guys stand for, who you are, how you want to speak to the world, and then use that as your differentiator. And so it works no different on your own, if you're doing it from a personal, figure out what separates you, figure out what gives you a unique point of view. For me, uh, it was, I just always kind of had this interest in, and this goes back to when I was, you know, 18, uh, this idea of kind of philosophy, self-improvement, happiness, all this, like I was really into uh, psychology, but I wasn't into like what made us weird or, you know, like I, I didn't care about the, the stuff that, um, you know, like abnormal psychology, I cared in the like, what is, what can psychology tell us about living our best possible life? Like, how can I be the happiest person possible? What, what, what do we know about that? And so that was really just a background hobby interest of mine. And then I realized that some of these ideas are so eternal that they can, and they're so general that they apply to so many different aspects of your life. And so I just started taking some of these ones that have been sitting in my head and apply them to marketing, apply them to creativity, apply them to social media. There's so many tweets that I have. If you literally just take out the word social media in my tweet and put in life, it, it works. It, it's just as yeah. relevant. Yeah. And so that's all of a sudden gave me this perspective or this voice or this tone or whatever it is that no one else was doing, that no one else could, could really, uh, I mean, you could copy it, but you know it would sound like something I said. And so just doing it with that amount of consistency and then doing it with a, a way that no one else was doing it, that I was able to own, 
And then also to have a little luck. I, I got retweeted really early by Jack Dorsey, coincidentally, like just by chance. Like there was nothing I could have done. He just happened to see something and like it. Um, I had a few tweets go viral and, and millions of people saw them. And there's no way to plan for that. So it, it was certainly a health, healthy dose of luck, but you can't have that luck if you're not doing the other two. So the idea is to put yourself in a position where as much luck will hit you as, as possible. I love that. Um, what about luck? Does it, you can't really rely on that for building community. So no. it seems like you have to have those other things in place before you know, you start thinking about your community engagement and the strategy there. Um, mm -hmm. What do you think brands need to do to really engage in them, especially when people are turning to social for connection right now mm -hmm. through the COVID-19 crisis um, and, you know, more people need a sense of belonging. Yeah. And, you know, especially you, you mentioned happiness and connection is part of that equation. For sure. So what you've got to do is it doesn't start with social media. It starts with knowing what the brand stands for. It starts with knowing what your mission is and what you want uh, people to do. And, it, and to make the decision that like, we're going to invest in building this community. If you've got a company that like, we don't really necessarily have any brand pillars. We don't have certain things that we're going to talk about. We don't have a reason for someone to follow us. It's going to be really, really hard as a social media manager to build that. You're gonna to have to make sure that you have buy-in at all levels of the organization, that they trust you, that this is a process that makes sense and that these pillars and, and what you want the brand to stand for is already clearly defined. So a good example would be Ben and Jerry's. They stand for social reform, social justice. They've been doing it for years. So when uh, you know everything that's happened in the past few months all kind of bubbled up and, and you know it, it was a national or, or global, um, uh, crisis and story, they were they had already done the work. They'd already built the community. They had already had people passionate about it because it was baked into their DNA. If you're a company that's never talked about it, never thought about it, and now you're thinking about doing it, know that you're going to have to build that into all your comms. You have to build that into all your marketing. You have to build that into all your branding. I'm not saying every piece of those have to reflect that, but you has to be part of your playbook. And so, if you're trying to do it just on social and you're trying to do it where you're constantly defending why you're doing it, it's going to be really hard. It's going to be really exhausting and you're probably not going to, uh, you know, be able to sustain it. But if you have a company that you guys have explicitly stated that this is who we are, this is what we stand for. This is what we're going to do on social media. It becomes a lot easier to be empowered. And, and also know about your brand. Like if you, if you're, if you are a social media manager and you're fighting for this, you want everyone around, you want people on, on social to follow you and have that community, but your company just doesn't care. You're probably pushing a rock up a boulder, you know, a boulder up a hill. But if you can get a company that cares and, it, and is invested in it, that's where you can make a difference. And honestly, it's part of the reason that I took the job I did is that we were aligned on what we wanted to do on social media. So it was an easy decision to make and it's so much more effective to feel empowered as opposed to having to defend every decision you make. Yeah, it's a, it's a metaphor for life too, right? In terms of mm -hmm. wasting so much energy trying to defend something or explain something and really just staying aligned. Um, I, I'm so happy for you that um, you feel excited about your new job. Um, what else are you excited about as you kind of head into the rest of 2020? Um, so, so really, it's, it, it is mostly about the cool opportunities with, with this job. Um, and I don't want to make this sound like a, an advertisement for the new company. So I'll talk more generally. I'll, I'll say this to anyone who's doing any job where the roadmap is not, uh, you know, tangible. It's not, it's, you have to design the map. The hardest issue I have right now is there's so many different routes that we could take. Um, and it become, it's easy to all of a sudden get excited be like, we could go, you know, I'll just use a map as a metaphor. It's like, we could go to Nashville and there's all this cool stuff in Nashville. We could see live music and it'd be so awesome. Or we could go to Denver and there's this, you know, there's mountains and it's beautiful outside. Or we could go to Vegas and we could just have a blast and we could hang out in the pool. And it's easy to get excited about any one of those opportunities. But the hard part is actually picking one and going, no, we're going to Denver. We're going to go outside. We're going to go hiking and we're going to find a, a cold lake to jump in. And we're going to go, uh, you know, ride a bike through the mountains. 
and you you have to get narrower and narrower and narrower and you just have to pick a lane because you can't get distracted by all those other opportunities that you have because it's just going to make it so that you never end up in Denver in the first place. Mm -hmm. So the hardest part for me is like, I could do this cool thing and I could do this cool thing and I could do this cool thing. And I just have to say, no, I, I, I've, I've got to pick one cool thing, stick with it for a few weeks or a few months really, and see if it resonates. And if it does, double down on it. And if it doesn't, cut it and move on to one of those other places that I talked about. And it's not to say you have to pick, you know, in this analogy, you can obviously only visit one city at a time, but you can pick two or three ideas, but you can't pick seven, eight, nine, or 10. You have to just do a handful and see what works. Right. You can't drive across the country um, <laughs> seven different, I mean, you can, but you have yeah. to choose one way. <laughs> well, we'll yeah. be following um, your developments and your progress and I'll be yeah. on social with you. Uh, but Matt, uh, I, I, By the way, I use that analogy anyways, because I'm literally about to go drive cross country for the next few months and live in different cities. So that was a very, uh, you know, uh, it was on my mind, top of mind example. Yeah, and I know you'll be documenting behind the scenes on Instagram, right? Yeah, yeah, for, for yep. sure. I'm going to figure out uh, something to do on stories, pictures, who knows, that we'll kind of figure it out. But what's cool too is the reason I'm able to do this is, uh, uh, again, the FAST, the, the company I work for, has a flexible work policy. So you don't have to be in the office. You don't have to be at home. You can be anywhere. And what, instead of you know saying like, great, what a, what a cool thing and it makes me happy, my goal is to turn it into content for the company that helps recruit more people. So you're thinking like, what a... You know, the, the idea being that you can show how work is changing in 2020 and beyond and hopefully attract talent that you otherwise wouldn't be able to attract just based on this coincidence that I happen to be doing this. So instead of, um, you know, saying we're doing X, Y and Z, it's like, again, let's look at the hand we're dealt and can we do anything with those cards? Yeah, well, that sounds like a really interesting project. Um, and safe travels. But thank you, yeah, thank Matt, you. for joining us today. And um, Stay safe. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Appreciate appreciate you having me on. And thank you to our audience for continuing to follow and watch this series. Ad Week Together will be back next week on the future of mindfulness with Dan Harris. Again, we invite you to have a corporate subscription or a special subscription on adweek.com slash offer to unlock unlimited access to our content and resources. Thank you so much and have a great final week of July 2020.